Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Joe's 42 years old, and he went to UCLA and partied a lot while he was there, but C's get degrees, so he graduated and had good fraternity connections that landed him a business job. And a couple years later, that would send him to a place called Bentonville, Arkansas. He would meet his wife here, and he's now, uh, they now have two kids, and he grew up Catholic, she grew up Baptist, so they found their way to this church called Fellowship Bible Church. And he would tell you that he doesn't really even know if Jesus is real, doesn't really follow him, but he loves that his kids get good moral influence on Sunday mornings and have good friends. Jessica grew up in Utah, one of six siblings. She and her family were raised in the LDS church. After going on mission and attending BYU, she met her husband, and they now have four kids of their own and call Centerton home, and they are some of, if not the nicest people that you will meet in our community. But like all of us, she struggles and feels the pressure of not breaking down because her family needs her to hold all things together. Sanjay moved here 10 years ago from India as a single guy uh, looking to grow his career. He comes from a Hindu background and loves Christians, and he actually sees Jesus as a God, just like thousands of other gods. He's found lots of hobbies here to try out, like flight school and kayaking and theater, but he has never been invited into an American home, not once. Mina, a refugee brought here from Afghanistan, now in her late 50s, her husband was actually killed due to political corruption, and she and her daughters and their families were seeking safety, fled the country, and ended up on a plane that landed them in some cow fields in northwest Arkansas. She barely speaks English and is doing everything she can to pay rent and provide for her family just to have enough to eat each week. Matthew was raised in the church, grew up a good Christian boy, and at age 11 realized he had same-sex attraction. And he'd heard the stat that 83% of the LGBTQ community was actually raised in the church. So he thought, maybe I can tell somebody. And when he did, his friends called him gross, his parents didn't know what to do with him, and so he actually left the church, not necessarily just because of theological differences, but because he felt abandoned. I made all of those up, but I guarantee you those people exist, maybe by different names in our community. In fact, one of you here may identify pretty closely with one of those descriptions, and if you do, Hey, welcome to Fellowship Bible Church. We are very glad that you're here to learn and worship with us this morning. Some of you may not identify with one of those stories, but you may actually be feeling a little uncomfortable to think that someone like that might be in this room worshiping with us today. Welcome to Fellowship Bible Church. We're really glad that you are here as well. If I were able to sit down with these five people for dinner, what would the six of us have in common? Probably a lot more than we might realize at first glance, but I would say there's one major similarity that invites all of us to the table, one thing that brings us all together, is that each one of the six of us is created in the image of God. Men and women, different stories, different races, different nationalities, different ages, different struggles. And this is actually a truth that we find on the first pages of our Holy Scriptures. And so for those of you who are newer to us, the way we usually do teaching series is we pick a book of the Bible or a section of a book of the Bible and teach verse by verse through it. And try to have a balanced diet of Old Testament, New Testament, uh, narrative, theology. Every once in a while, we will actually pick a topic or a theme, though, and spend a few weeks on that, still pulling from a text of scripture. And so that's what we're going to do for these next six weeks as we look at the first couple of chapters of Genesis and talk about what is the image of God in humanity and how does it actually play out. I'll go ahead and tell you, 
there are some deep theological concepts that will probably hurt your brain uh, during this because for the last four weeks, mine has been mush, trying to wrap my head around some of these things. But it's worth going into as a church. When you look at the story of Scripture, it begins with six days of God creating all of existence. I mean, he is speaking, and things are coming into being, right? Galaxies, mountains, living, breathing creatures, birds, fish, all of it. He's speaking these things into existence. But on day six, he actually does something very interesting. Rather than just speaking something to existence and then maybe giving a little commentary on it, he stops and he goes a little deeper into the makeup of the thing of which he is creating. And he says, this one is going to be different, unlike anything else that I've created thus far, because this one I'm going to create in my image. And we see that in Genesis 1, 26 through 27. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. So God created man in his own image, In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. So to properly understand humanity, number one, good luck with that. Number two, we have to start here. And we have to have a good good grasp of what God is communicating in this section of Scripture. It carries a lot of weight that the creator God would say that you and I are in some way created like him in his image, in his likeness. What complicates this even more is that this is not what was originally written. And this is kind of where our American gospel blows up a little bit. America is not God's nation, right? We know this. Jesus is not white. And the holy scriptures were not originally inspired into English, okay? In fact, English wasn't even a language at this point. This was. And I think this is Genesis 127. I think. I copied and pasted it. For all I know, it could be an ancient recipe of unleavened bread. I literally have no context of what that says. I trust people like Tyler Heston and others of you who actually do deep theological study on different languages to understand what this means. So some smarter people can actually transliterate it into an alphabet that I somewhat understand, that I can read, but still, this is not much more helpful, right? I look at this and I go, I don't know what these words are. We're left to trust people who do understand some of these original languages to actually translate them for us. With that being said, it's important to note that there is some human opinion in the English Bible. That's why we have different translations, because different people or different committees actually vote on what they think the best interpretation and translation of this word is into the English language. I hesitate to bring that up because I don't want you to lose trust in your English scriptures. This is the word of God. But when we get to some maybe controversial or even just deep theological concepts, it is worth studying a little bit deeper. And I think that's what we have to do here with Genesis 1:27 because we've seen it misinterpreted at times. Some people actually believe that men are the ones who are created in the image of God, but not women because women were created from men. And at first glance, when I read this in the English language, I can see why they might reach that conclusion. God created who? In his own image. Man. And then later, it says something about female. And so how do we understand that and uh, wrestle with it? This is where I think the English language doesn't do us justice. So let's look a little deeper. Uh, I want to look at three words very quickly. Adam which is what's translated man, zahar, which is translated male, and inkeva, which is translated female. You will notice that man and male here are not the same words. And this is not God separating sex and gender. From the beginning, he has tied those things together in his creation story. What I believe is actually being communicated here is that the word man doesn't point to the male species but to all mankind. This is one of the concepts that I've been wrestling with for weeks, trying to get to a a one-minute synopsis, and it's probably not going to be there, but here's the attempt, okay? The word Adam here can mean Adam, 
man, mankind, because when Adam was created, he was all of those things. You realize that. He was Adam himself. He was the male species. He also was the whole human race at that point. So if there's confusion as to what we should translate this word to, it's because at that point in history, they were the same thing when this was originally spoken out. So based on context, I think a better English word here is mankind, is the human race. And if it is mankind, then God creates all of humanity in his image, and then within humanity, he uniquely designs and creates male and female. And the creation mandates that he's going to give actually require them to be equally involved to fulfill his purpose. So I bring that up because we have to have equality here before we ever go into distinction and things like that in future weeks. And let the weight of that verse sit in for just a second. All of humanity for all time is created in the image and likeness of the all-powerful, all-knowing creator, Yahweh. Everyone. This isn't something that's just said about followers of Jesus thousands of years later. All men and women in his image. The word image is unique, right? These are images. So on one hand, they're surface level things, but in reality, image runs much deeper than just what we can see. We live in an image-saturated culture and world. Our own image is a huge deal. We find security in what people see us as. We judge ourselves by image, whether it's body image, social media image, the perceived image of others. We actually profit off of it. Some people do. You ever heard of name, image, and likeness with the NCAA? You realize those three words are found in the first chapter of Genesis? And so the NCAA is using biblical foundational truth to define what someone is worth, probably without even knowing it. But this is where we see a foundation of who we are created to be. And we spend so much time trying to define our own image by maybe the job that we have, the money that we make, sexual identity, whether or not we're married, whatever it may be. But where do we find our image and our worth? It's in none of those things, but in the image of God that somehow he has given to a specific part of his creation, humanity. But it says that we're different than the rest, right? The image is what makes us different, which means it can't be that we have eyes and ears or that we can walk or that we can make decisions or even that we reproduce because other creatures do that. And I truly believe it's much more spiritual than it is physical because God is a spirit being and there's something about humanity that's supposed to be a, an image, a signpost, a mirror that's pointing to his presence in a way. And I also think that that's part of the reason God consistently rebukes Israel when they attempt to make images of him. because He's like, I don't need those. I've already put my image on the earth. Think about it. When we see sunrises and sunsets, it shows off the creativity of the creator, but not his image. When we see the beautiful tulips on the downtown square, it shows the beauty of our creator, but not his image. Becky Stewart is a longtime member here at Fellowship. She was at our house a couple weeks ago for a leader gathering. She had just gotten back from an, the Amazon mission trip that took place back in March. And I said, how'd it go? And here's what she said. God is really big and his image is everywhere. She was not talking about the Amazon River, but the people that she met there. And it's convicting for me because I worship God, sometimes with tears, every time I see a sunrise or a sunset, every time. But how often do I worship him when I see what he says is his most beautiful creation? People created in the Imago Dei. Mago Dei is a Latin phrase, you may have heard that, meaning image of God. We use it to describe the image of God. It's not actually what's in the text, because this is uh, Hebrew originally. So what we have is actually Salem Elohim. And the question is, what is it? What is Salem Elohim, the image of God? Fortunately or unfortunately, the Bible is not a textbook with definitions. So I can't just look it up. What, what is this thing? This is a story. It's a group of stories 
real stories, God-inspired truth, but we can't just go look up what this thing is. So we use other resources, and a lot of the Greek and Hebrew resources that I use come from blueletterbible.org. It's free. Um, I would encourage you to write that down. I do not get NIL deals as a pastor, so not sponsored. You can trust. I just like their website, but I don't have a great working definition for you. If you were expecting that to find out what the image of God is and get out of here, came to the wrong church this morning. I'm going to give you some categories to think through of where we see the image of God connected with humanity. And here's the first one. We have a unique identity. As humans, we are created with identity. We don't have to wonder about what gives us worth and value. Before we can ever make our first decision, take our first step, breathe our first breath, There is something in us that is unique from all creation that gives us value, identity, and worth. God chose to allow us to image him in a way on this earth, and he blessed us in that endeavor, and that's at the core of who we are. It's about our identity, but also there's some communal language that we see in this creation story in related to the image of God. Notice it here. Let us make mankind in our image. After our likeness, male and female, he created them. There isn't enough here in the first couple of chapters to fully understand the Trinity. I don't know if there's enough in Scripture for us to fully wrap our minds around the Trinity, but there's hints here of a triune God. And it's in that spirit of diversity and unity that he creates the human species, male and female. And he creates us to need each other. God did not see Adam, did not see man as this all-sufficient being without need. Adam needed Eve. Men need women. Women need men. We are better together. And by the way, that is not a marriage comment. That is a community relation comment, a human relationship issue. That is the community of men and women together reflecting the image of God. That's what's beautiful. And community Y'all, this is pre-fall. This is before sin disrupts things. This is when it is really, really good. And it's actually sin that makes us want to isolate. But the image of God is what draws us back to people. And then there's a third aspect where I see the image of God playing out in humanity, and it's with purpose. There's a different purpose that that we have versus the rest of creation. Look at what he says. Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, have dominion. We are creative because God is creative. We cultivate, nurture, and work because those are things that God does. We fill the earth because we want to take the empty spaces and fill them with beauty based on the the gifts and talents that God has equipped us with. Now, with this purpose category, we do have to be careful. There's a false theology that's actually pretty popular in uh, some different circles called dominionism or dominion theology. And I don't know all the intricacies of it, but in summary, I would say it basically means that Christians should rule the world. We should have dominion like we were originally intended to. So we infiltrate government, we infiltrate business, music, arts, etc., to take over and put God back on the throne. Obvious theology issue with that is that God has never left his throne. And he doesn't need us to do that. And this is a huge misinterpretation of a passage like this, which which commands us to have dominion over the earth, especially in light of the life of Jesus and the method in which he chose to rule and reign thousands of years later. And so with that misinterpretation, I actually think there's a couple of myths that we need to take a few minutes and debunk about Genesis 1 and the image of God. Myth number one, being created in God's image means that you and I were, are, or will be God's. Adam and Eve did experience original righteousness and holiness, but they were in no way equal to God. Humans reflect aspects of God, but we don't hold a state of godness ourselves. We are created beings, and there are actually religions that associate themselves really closely with Christianity that would disagree and say, no, we are gods or we can be gods. We do not see that in the text or in our Christian doctrine. That would be a myth. Myth number two Men and women are created for marriage. This is another one that, like, I got to give you in a minute, but we could talk about this for hours. 
Let me start by saying that I value and agree with God's design for marriage. And I do believe that marriage in so many ways is a valuable and vital part of not only humanity, but God's work here on earth. It's something that he's given us to, to display him. But I feel like, especially in Christian circles, we can put marriage on a platform that it's the pinnacle of human existence. Like, this is what I was created for. My encouragement would be we can't make Genesis 1 and 2 do what it's not meant to do. We have to understand this is just a frame to a much larger story. And if we only look at chapter 1, we can't understand the full story. And at the same time, if we read the whole story without chapter 1, we're going to be completely lost because it's important, but it doesn't give us everything we need. What do I mean by that? Were Adam and Eve created to be married to each other? Yes. They had to be. It was one man and one woman. If they weren't, if they didn't take this command that God's given to reproduce in the context of marriage, we wouldn't exist. I used to be pretty frustrated that there wasn't a a clear picture of a wedding for them. It's just like, we're just assuming that they're married? Like, where's the wedding ceremony? And it's this reframe that's helped me understand that maybe we don't have the marriage ceremony because the point here isn't that every human is designed for marriage, but that every human is designed for community. Adam and Eve were were in such a unique context at the foundation of the world. And I am not against marriage at all. I love my wife more than I ever thought possible to love a human being. But if you are single in here, Genesis 1 to 2 does not leave you out. In fact, we don't preach a theology of forever family in heaven or marriage getting you bonus points in the afterlife. So if you're single, you're experiencing something incredible. According to Jesus, marriage won't even exist in the afterlife. So if your full devotion is to Jesus and the community of the believers, his followers, you have a foretaste of something that I don't have. And that's nothing about my marriage. It's that both of us are experiencing something special and unique. Marriage is great, but not our ultimate calling. Myth number three, my brain hurts already, I'm sorry. This one's gonna make it worse. Myth, uh, God is male. God is not a dude, okay? Jesus is, Jesus chose to take on humanity, to take on male humanity, but God's being is communicated in both feminine and masculine, motherly and fatherly ways throughout all of scripture. You go, well, Jesus calls him father. He does. He does do that. But that doesn't mean he's a male because he, he's not human. We call him father because Jesus calls him father, but he uses that term for relational intimacy in a language that humans can understand, not to sig- signify that God himself is a man. Okay? My brain hurts. Myth number four creation order implies supremacy of men over women. I'll squash this one very quickly. To say that women are inferior to men because woman was created from man would logically lead us to conclude that men are inferior to dirt. Let that sink in. That's not what's being communicated here. But humans, since the beginning of time, since the fall really, have struggled with power and authority and supremacy. And that's always been the case. But from the creation story, we see God put men and women together. To have women even as part of this creation story, this is one of the things that my friend Johanna really helped me see. This would have been like ideologically in opposition to the cultures at the time. To have women a part of the story and to call them equals and say they were created in the image of God. But that's what his image does for us, for humanity. Myth number five, the fall eliminated the image of God in mankind. Mark's actually going to have a whole week on this, so I'm not going to go in depth, but I think it's worth mentioning here in these myths because we see references to the image of God in mankind after the fall in the Old Testament and the New Testament. There's multiple verses, which means the image within us may be obscured, but it's not obliterated. This is our front door, okay? Okay. A couple weeks ago, we had a little accident, and a rock broke it. Uh, thank the Lord, though, for tempered glass. And when you look at it, like, 
Is it in place? Yes. Is it broken? Yes. Is it doing what it's supposed to do? Kinda? But not for long. In fact, this was a couple weeks ago. The big windstorm that we had just took it all off. Okay, is gone. Because over time, when something like this is broken, it's going to break down unless it's restored. And there are only three true humans that have ever existed on earth without this. Adam, Eve, and Jesus. That's the list. Every single other person, all the rest of us, are some distorted and broken version of humanity. So if our image is obscured or distorted, how do we know what we're intended to be like? I love it when y'all ask good questions. We look to Jesus. Our best chance at a sound understanding of the image of God in humanity is not for me to come up with some working definition. That would be helpful, but the best thing we can do is to look at the image itself. Not just someone who images God, but he is the image. He is the full essence, the exact imprint of his nature. What we long to have restored, we don't even fully understand what has been broken and what hasn't, but when we look to Jesus, we see it complete. We see the fullness, the hints of community and relationship with God, unhindered by sin or living and breathing in the person of Jesus Christ. And there is a plan to restore what's been broken in us. It's already well in motion. In fact, it's already been accomplished. And we wait hopefully and faithfully for the fruition of it. But in the meantime, if we want people to have a genuine encounter with this incredible Savior, especially people who don't believe in him or don't agree with him or don't follow him or in opposition, then we have to learn to emphasize this foundational attribute of the creation story, that you and I are created in God's image, each one of us. And we teach people that God wants to know you, that Jesus wants to dine at your table, to come to your house, to process your fears and your hurts no matter where you've come from. That's not setting aside the gospel, right, and just being overly gracious and throwing away truth. That's embodying it in the full ways that Jesus himself did. He came to restore the image broken for those who would trust in his work on the cross on their behalf. So regardless of whether someone has trusted in Jesus or not, we have to remember that each person on this earth was created uniquely in God's image and has dignity because of that. That's why we believe that Christians should be the leading voice in talking about the dignity of all humanity because we know where it comes from. It's God's image within us. That's why the image of God conversation, this theology, is the answer against racism, against sexism, against classism, any other ism that divides people. It's the image of God within us that unites us because there's something within you and me that reflects the very image of the all-powerful creator. Some of you may leave frustrated. I may leave frustrated because I don't have a working definition of what this is. But that's okay because I don't think we can fully know what it is. What parts do we have? What's been broken? What will be restored? But the truth that we can hold on to is that God says all humanity has it. That's something that the church can grasp onto as we live. So when we speak with someone, that tells us that we have the privilege of seeing and learning about another masterpiece, a craftsmanship of God. We take time to hear stories of other image bearers. Preston Sprinkle says it like this, we think deeply, yes, but we love widely. And on top of that, we listen curiously. A, a couple weeks ago, I had the chance to listen uh, to some of my friends, some of the people that I look up to, and it was uh, these five women. If you've ever found yourself in a room where you really quickly realize you're the least intelligent person in the room, you can identify with me, because that's what I felt. Because I, I want you to see their faces and hear their names, because Johanna, Anisha, Rochelle, Beth, and Elena took hours of their own personal study time and then came and had a lunch with some of our staff to help us craft the content behind this. Um, and I was challenged 
I was challenged on some of my own, you know, preconceived notions of how I read the creation story. But I was also really encouraged to know that I get to walk alongside image bearers like them. And so, in a way, you've heard from them this morning already uh, because they helped with this. But we get to hear from one of them personally uh, as well. This is my friend, Beth Kenyon. Uh, Most of you probably know who she is. Um, But here's what I would say about Beth. I've had the, the privilege of calling her friend for about 12 years But I would say definitely over the last three years, as we've kind of helped launch Fellowship Bentonville alongside each other, um, I needed her so much in my life. And I've seen the image of God displayed in her, yes, as a female, but more just as an image bearer, as you've mentored my wife, as you've mentored me, as you've been a friend and a teammate with me. And there's no doubt that there's thousands of men and women who've come through fellowship over the last 30 years that your leadership has greatly influenced. And so... It is well worth our time to hear what God has done in your own heart and life. And so we'd love for you to share a little bit about the image of God and how you've seen that work out. Thank you. I was probably in my mid-30s when I first heard somebody talking about what it meant to place your identity in Christ. Finding my identity in Christ means my value comes from being his child and not what I do or whose mom I am. It was a new concept for me, but I could see how important it was for me to reflect the image of God in everything I didn't say. Parenting three children has a way of revealing that need. Learning to live with purpose and in my new identity has taken time, and it is an ongoing process. If I want to reflect the image of God, I needed to study scripture to understand about him more. It's important to understand what is true about God and his character and what wasn't. And I realized I had a whole bunch of ideas about God that just weren't true. Here's a few of them. I learned that God's image has nothing to do with my appearance, how I wear my hair, or how much weight I have. Living in God's image is not exclusive Every person bears his image. The image of God isn't described as being a male or a female. I realize that God's character isn't just powerful, fierce, and strong. It is also gentle and compassionate. His image is not changed by my sin or my crazy. It's not earned or withheld. It has nothing to do with whether I work in the home or outside of the home. It's not confused with being Tim's wife or Joshua, Carly, or Tyler's mom, or G to six grands. <laughs> my, my identity is in Christ is not the same as my calling. His image is lived out through my calling. I've heard you in multiple settings, not just teaching settings, but just normal conversations. Talk about the identity uh, of of Christ in you. Expand a little more on that. Go a little deeper, what, what you mean. Well, God has graciously and lovingly shown me what it looks like to live as his image bearer. But it's come through... Um, seeking an intimacy in my relationship with him. This relationship really was the starting point of my transformation. I discovered that my value is found in Jesus and being his precious child. I have to believe who God says I am, whether I feel it or not. This believing happens through reading scripture and listening to his voice and giving the Holy Spirit room and space to change the way I think, just like it says in Romans 12, 2. It means I'm totally loved, completely whole, and I am a new creation. It takes practice to learn how to use my God-given gifts, my perspective, and my voice. Living in my new identity means I have to preach to myself, I don't have to live guarded or ashamed and letting go of all those woulda, couldas, and shouldas that people say. Only God can help me figure it out. It's being honest 
and vulnerable. I don't have to live guarded or ashamed or in shame. Letting go of what is not true or what others say I should be and holding on to the fact that Jesus Christ lives in me. Being in community has been key. Letting myself be known and willing to be vulnerable has been a huge part of this process. Dear friends who pray for me, who speak truth to me, who keep me focused on Jesus have been such a gift. And they've often believed in me when I couldn't believe in myself. Living in God's image means I need to keep practicing gentleness and compassion and empathy along with courage, strength, and knowing when to be fierce. It's not one over the other. When I start to feel weighed down, it's really a signal that my identity is coming from somebody or something else than Jesus. My angst is usually a good sign of this. And several times I've needed somebody to point me back to who God says I am. I love it. I've, I've seen the identity of, of Jesus, the image of God, um, play out in multiple aspects of your life, not only as friend and teammate, but also as I've watched you and Tim uh, in your marriage. You are pretty different people. Uh, would you agree? <laughs> That's no shock to yeah. those of you that know us both. <laughs> um, we'll say created uniquely, uh, uniquely designed. But in your marriage, how have you seen the image of God play out in both of you? Well, it's been both beautiful and it's hard. I am learning that I need to keep remembering that Tim is a part of God and created in his image. <laughs> <That's good. laughs> It's true, Tim, if you're in here. <laughs> <laughs> he left fast. <laughs> he was here for a service. Yeah, okay, okay. <laughs> um, learning how to do this together has really given us a greater sense of purpose. We both struggle and have to be reminded to give each other the grace and space to keep figuring it out. But I am so thankful for Tim. He's not pressured me to look or act a certain way. His unique perspective and gentleness has helped me see more of God's image. And when we both encourage each other and give each other the courage to live in God's image, it really is beautiful. I think I'll always struggle with how to let my independence and self-sufficiency be a healthy part of our relationship. When I don't... <laughs> Um, when it's not working right, we tend to push each other away and pull apart. But allowing myself to need Tim and taking time to let him know me has helped us stay connected. It's been holy and hard work. Mm, that's good. Well, talk, talk with me about work. I know probably one of the biggest joys of your life is the coworkers that you get to work alongside. Am I right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Thank you. <laughs> um, Missed that cue. <laughs> What about just the image of God working out you as a working woman in this context? Like, what have you learned through that as well? Well, Ephesians 2.10 says we are created in God's image to do good works. So work is a part of his plan. The work he designed for me means every day I need his help displaying his character. Um, ministry is not my identity but it's the place I get to use my gift and voice to help others see who Jesus really is. It's not about the work I do. I do the work God has given me. Mm. For me, this has meant serving with a team of people, showing respect and appreciation for the way they think and see the world. Sometimes it's hard, but I've learned so much about who God is and what he looks like through the pe these people the way they work, and the way they reflect God to me. Whether I'm following or leading, I must bear Christ's image. I must be an image bearer. It has been challenging to figure it out, um, my identity at work, as a leader, as a strong woman, when I'm the only female voice in the group, when I get frustrated or disagree, when something triggers my hurt or I get embarrassed, when I feel unheard, when roles become more important than purpose. When we place our identity in roles or a position 
or what we accomplish, we get pulled away from our purpose. Mm -hmm. When this purpose happens, when this happens, we need to help each other refocus on serving the king. Together, God is calling women and men, young and old, all people to help others know who Jesus really is. It's beautiful and hard and often messy, but all of us need encouragement to keep living as image bearers of Christ. When you see somebody displaying God's image, please encourage them. When you see somebody losing focus, gently remind them of their value and point them back to their true identity in Christ. Reflecting God's glory and helping others do the same is the gospel. That is the great commission, and that's what we, our purpose is here on earth. Together, we can demonstrate what God looks like in community. Can you imagine what Bittenville would look like if we lived with purpose? Hunter, I think about what it would look like for God to be in every neighborhood, in every workplace, and in every home. It's exciting to think about what mm. that would look like. Yeah, it's one of our desires for our church, for you, for us, that we would continue to grow in what it means to be an image bearer. Um, that as we go, that there's reflections everywhere of who God is and the way that he, he lives. And so we know one of the best ways to grow in this is not just to sit and listen to us all day. We're just two image bearers. Um, amongst more. One of the best ways to grow is in community, in conversation. We don't have books for this series. We don't uh, have those fancy printed things that are really, really helpful, but we do have discussion guides. Um, so each week, we will put some discussion questions on our website. If you go to where you stream these services, right under the, the service video, you'll just see a link that says discussion guide. I think there's eight or nine questions this week for you and your community group, you with a spouse, you with a roommate, uh, friends, with your kids, to sit down and really process through some of this because, you know, there's a lot more to process and we want to do that in community. We value connection, uh, a couple of specific ways to connect coming up. Uh, men's retreat is in less than two weeks out at Ponca Bible Camp. We have about 20 spots left. We've had over 100 men uh, sign up now. And if you haven't, we would love to have you out uh, for those two nights uh, just to get to be together with other men and sharpen each other as we're seeking to follow Jesus um, and also Courtyard Nights coming up this Friday, which has very little redeeming spiritual value, but <laughs> is going to be really fun. Um, and as much as we're trying to do multi-generational here at Fellowship Bentonville, we want people, I'm sorry I did this, people of different ages, uh, to sit together <laughs> at the table. I just have it, my bad. We also want to provide connection opportunities for people who are new to the area who want to meet folks their age. So if you're on the younger half, uh, we're saying 20s and 30s. Um, no matter your stage of life, come out this Friday night. We'll have some food trucks you can buy dinner, have some live music from our friends at Church Street, the band. We'd love to have you out 530, just right out here. Also, just general connections for community. We remind you all of this each week because we want people in community processing life together. So you can always sign up for a small group, men's group, women's group, community group. And then we will be here after the service. Our prayer team will be over here as well if you want to process anything. Will you pray for us, Beth, as we end today? Oh, Jesus, it really is incredible that your image is alive in us. Lord, would you keep us figuring out and processing what it means to be your reflection with the people we're around. Thank you for these beautiful people. Thank you that you're always with us and growing us and teaching us. We do love you so much. In your precious name, amen. Amen. Have we'll a good week. See y'all next week. Didn't mean.